Welcome to Grace Church. Let's worship together. Have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. I'm the potter. That's wrong, isn't it? That's often how we think. You are the potter, I'm the clay. And Lord, we, um, we want you to be at work in our lives. We want you to have your way. We know that that always isn't always the way, what we would choose, but, but we want you to be Lord. And that means you have your way in our lives. And we're here this morning to worship you, whether it's in this room or by TV ministry, or maybe we're watching on, uh, online. But we're here to worship because this is part of how we get in the right place so that you can be in the right place in our lives. Worship, Lord, is part of putting ourselves in the right relationship with you. So let us worship in spirit and truth. Let us recognize you as the God of glory and our Savior, the master of time and eternity, and our friend. Let us worship you and bring your blessing upon us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. It's good to have you here this morning. Are you warm? Yes. But are you brave? Well, you braved it here, so I'm glad you are here. Let's, would you stand with me? Let's join in the call to worship as we come into God's presence. This is the day the Lord has made. This is the day spoken of by the prophet Joel. I will pour out my spirit on all people, and all who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. Our first hymn is 
a worship the king. Remember, we're going to listen as Joe plays through the tune, and then we will read the text. above, O oh, gratefully sing God's power and God's love, our shield and defender, the ancient of days, pavilioned in splendor and girded with praise. Thy bountiful care, what tongue can recite? It breathes in the air, it shines in the light, it streams from the hills, it descends to the plain, and sweetly distills in the dew and the rain. Frail children of dust, and feeble as frail, in thee do we trust, nor find thee to fail. Thy mercies, how tender, how firm to the end, our maker, defender, redeemer, and friend. Pray with me the prayer of God's people, if you will. God our Father, the strength of all those who put their trust in you, accept our prayers. Through the weakness of our mortal nature, we can do no good thing without you. Grant us the help of your grace, that in keeping your commands, we may please you, both by our will and our deeds. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. You may be seated.
Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we've come into your presence. We are before the throne of grace And thankfully, your Son, our Savior, is there at your side on our behalf, interceding for us. And he knows just how to do that. He knows how to come into your presence and seek help for us and power. He knows how to bring our praise into your presence even better than we do. And so, Lord, we give you thanks and praise. Because Jesus sends his Holy Spirit to be with us, and he is with you at your right hand, and your heart is with us because of Christ. And so, Lord, we know that we are in your care. Even when life does uh, become difficult and weary, and these, these months, these weeks have been trying. Uh, people have lost jobs. Uh, small businesses have struggled. All of us are struggling with uh, a measure of isolation. Uh, wanting to see those that we love and, and wanting to do the things that we love and being unable to do so. We think especially of those who are uh, perhaps in uh, a nursing home, personal care, and are really cut off from uh, family and friends in a way that's very uh, profound. And Lord, they need your grace. Uh, and for their families who, who feel helpless, uh, who feel separated. We pray for all of those who are facing an ongoing, a chronic uh, illness of some kind. The, the re relentless nature of that illness can wear out our strength our patience, our joy. But we give you thanks because in all of these things you care about us and you call us to cast our cares on you because you do care for us. And so, Lord, this morning across this, this room and throughout our TV congregation, and those who are joining us online, we, we bring those needs that are wearing us into your presence. And we tell you about them this morning. Each one of us lifts to you our, our fatigued hearts, our, uh, our worries, our needs. Because you hear us when we pray. Thank you, Heavenly Father. We feel your presence. We know your faithfulness. Sometimes when we, we can't see your hand moving, we learn to trust your grace. Help us with that. Lord, this morning we want to lift before you uh, dawn, and Dick, Lord, we are glad that he is home and doing well. Uh, we pray for Phil. We lift Pitt, Pete before you and also Sandy. Um, and Lord, we want to bring you praise. Um, one of our kids, uh, Rebecca, uh, married uh, her longtime fiancé. And we give you thanks for that love and that wedding and that time of blessing, and we pray, Lord, that your grace would rest on them as they begin that married life and as they look into the future uh, to, to live a lifetime in your service. 
Lord, I want to pray for friends of mine, uh, Dave and Nancy, uh, who celebrated their 50th anniversary just recently. And thank you for their faithfulness, uh, both to one another and in your service. Bless them and their family, we pray. Now, Lord, hear our thanksgiving. We want to bring to you praise because uh, we've brought to you our needs. And we know that you hear us, and so thank you, Father. Thank you for the good things that are at work in our lives already. Thank you for loved ones that we do see and we can talk to. And thank you, Lord, for the securities that we experience. Thank you, Lord, that even in this isolation, uh, we can find reasons for joy. Thank you for giving us those graces. So hear our prayers, receive our praise, and all of these we bring into your presence through the mighty name of Jesus as we pray together the prayer that he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We're not receiving the offering in the usual way. We're not passing the plates. Uh, I trust as you're able, you've used the offering box. Uh, but we want to continue remembering that uh, offering uh, tithes and offerings and gifts to the Lord is part of our worship. And so uh, I invite you to uh, think of those gifts that you've been able to bring. Maybe uh, reach into your pocket and take hold of your wallet and offer that all that you are to the Lord as we, uh, we worship him. Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that openly profess his name.
together the sacrifice of praise, the fruit of our lips. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above, ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. We offer to you these our tithes and gifts. Receive and bless them and us. Receive all this also the sacrifice of praise, the fruit of our lips, as we profess your great name and mercy, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Again, we are... What happened to it? All right, I was supposed to have a hymn here. So, Joe, play the hymn that I didn't include. We'll recognize it. You may be seated. Scripture this morning is from the second book of Kings, uh, chapter 5, verses 1 through 16. This is probably a familiar story. It's a, uh, commonly a vacation Bible school text. Uh, I think you'll recognize it as we begin to read it. Now, Naaman was commander of the army of the king of Aram. And just to clarify, Aram is what we would call Syria today. It's that same area. Damascus was the capital of Aram as it is the capital of Syria. Now, Naaman was commander of the army of the king of Aram. He was a great man in the sight of his master and highly regarded because through him the Lord had given victory to Aram. He was a valiant soldier, but he had leprosy. Now bands of raiders from Aram had gone out and had taken captive a young girl from Israel, and she served Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, if only my master would see the prophet who is in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. Naaman went to his master and told him what the girl from Israel had said. By all means, go, the king of Aram replied. I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So Naaman left, taking with him ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, ten sets of clothing. The letter that he took to the king of Israel read, With this letter I am sending my servant Naaman to you, so that you may cure him of his leprosy. As soon as the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his robes and said, Am I God? Can I kill and bring back to life? Why does this fellow send someone to me to be cured of his leprosy? See how he is trying to pick a quarrel with me. When Elijah, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his robes, he sent him this message. Why have you torn your robes? Have the man come to me, and he will know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman went with his horses and chariots and stopped at the door of, of Elisha's house. 
Elisha sent a messenger to say to him, Go wash yourself seven times in the Jordan, and your flesh will be restored, and you will be cleansed. But Naaman went away angry and said, I thought that he would surely come out to me and, and stand and, and call on the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the spot and cure me of my leprosy. Are not Abna and Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Couldn't I wash in them and be cleansed? So he turned and went away in a rage. And Naaman's, Naaman's servants went to him and said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do something, some great thing, would you not have done it? How much more than when he tells you to wash and be cleansed? So he went down and dipped himself in the Jordan seven times, as the man of God had told him. And his flesh was restored and became clean like that of a young boy. Then Naaman and all of his servants went back to the man of God. He stood before him and said, Now I know that there is no God in all the world except in Israel. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. No God in all the world except you, Father. No God in all the heavens no God in all there is, no God but you. And you've made yourself known to us and brought, reconciled us back to you by your Son, Jesus Christ. We give you thanks. We give you thanks for just these few words. No other God, no other God in all the world. Christ, I, I, what I want to talk about this morning is that Christ is with us in our crises. Um, and we're facing an ongoing one right now. Now, I, I just talked to a few people this morning, and they, and they said, you know, this, being lo locked at home, this is getting tedious. And don't you agree with that? And, and don't you agree that it's getting to be uh, a little bit not so much fun to have to wear a mask all the time. Now, maybe those are small things. None of us have been sick with COVID, and we know that uh, it is a serious illness, and it's not over, and we need to continue uh, to practice the mitigation uh, uh, practices that they tell us, you know, all the, all the stuff, wear the mask, watch your distance, wash your hands or sanitize them, the three W's. Uh, wear, watch, wash. Got to keep doing that. Uh, and, and, and you've heard the stories about um, college students who got to, this is true, they got together with people they knew had COVID to see who would get it next. And fortunately, at least one student has died of COVID because of that. It's not over. It's not funny. And so here we are in the middle of this. And this morning, I think it's a great time for us to think about this fact. Christ is with us in our crisis. Hebrews 4, uh, 14 and 16 reads this. See the, seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens... Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. Let us come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find help in time of need. Listen to those words. Let us come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in times of need that we may find grace to help in times of need. There it is, that Christ is in our crisis, that 
We have a great high priest, Jesus Christ, who has gone into the heavens. In other words, he's returned home. He's there at the right hand of the Father. He has the Father's ear, so to speak. And so, let's come boldly into the presence of God through Jesus Christ. And for this purpose, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in times of need. Uh, there's the challenge. Um, we, have, we, we aren't familiar with that concept. We know, if we don't know those words, we know that idea. We gotta confess, it's not an easy thing to do, is it? And you, when you're in the middle of the crisis, whatever it is, when you need him the most, you feel that need more than you feel his presence. You feel your weakness more than you feel his strength. And so we naturally say, where'd you go, right? Haven't you asked that? And so the writer of Hebrews says to us, let's come boldly into the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of needs. Now, uh, Naaman had a crisis. He was a well-regarded man. He, uh, he was well-regarded by the king, um, but we read the story. He uh, was a leper. Mel told me, uh, I, we were reading this text together, and, and um, she told me, you know, that, that's a little hard to follow. And so she said, I need to tell you who the characters are. So do you mind if I do that? If you already got it figured out, just follow along. If you're a little bit lost about who's kings and all that stuff, uh, maybe this will help. So, Naaman is the main human character in this story, right? And he is the commander of the army of Aram, and that's Syria, but he is a leper. That's the first guy. Now, we're going to move him off to the side, and then... In this story, God introduces this Jewish slave girl. She's been captured in the war and brought back to Damascus and just so happens, coincidence, places her in Naaman's house. She is serving Naaman's wife. And so she says to her mistress, you know what? I, I wish that my master, that's name and the guy with the leper, leprosy, I wish he would go to the prophet in Samaria. That's the capital of Israel. I wish he'd go to the prophet in Samaria. The prophet would heal him. She's certain. And so Naaman goes to his king. He goes to the king of Aram, the king of Syria, and he asks for permission to go because this is his boss. And he can't go wandering off without getting permission. Second, Aram and Israel have been at war. And so this is kind of a diplomatic mission as well. He needs permission. So, and the king says, yeah, go ahead. I'm going to write you a letter of introduction. This is a diplomatic thing. He's going to send a letter to the other king, say, it's okay. I'm sending this uh, guy in peace. And so Naaman takes the letter and he goes to the king of Israel. Remember what the letter said? I'm sending you my servant so that you can heal him of his leprosy. And what does the king of Israel say? Are you kidding me? Am I, he said, am I God that I can kill and give back to life? What, what is he asking me to do here? This is insane. It's kind of what he says. He says, I can't do this. And so there has to be some other motive. This guy has to know I can't do this. There has to be something else. Maybe he's trying to pick a fight with me so that he can have an excuse to come back and fight and we'll have war again. The man of God, Elisha, there is a man named Elijah. This is another guy, Elisha, hears about the crisis that now has traveled from Naaman to the king of Israel. And Elisha sends a message to the king of Israel and says, all right, king, what are you, what are you freaking out for? Take a deep breath. Calm down. Send him to me. Send him to me. 
and he will know there is a prophet in Israel. Uh, Elisha isn't... See, see, if there's a prophet in Israel, there has to be a God that the prophet serves. And he's going to demonstrate to Naaman the reality of this God. He's going to go... He's, he hasn't heard the words of the slave girl, but they resonate in his mind just the same because he knows the living God of Israel. She said, the prophet can heal him. Now she means God will heal him through the prophet. And Elisha says, send him to me. I'll take care of it. And so, um, Elisha uh, the Naaman, Naaman, I think this is funny. Naaman arrives in front of uh, uh, Elisha's house with his chariots and his camels. and I mean, the whole caravan shows up in front. These guys all show up in your driveway. There they are, sitting out there. And, and they come up and ring the doorbell. That's what this picture is. Um, and Elisha doesn't even come out. He, do, he, doesn't, uh, he, doesn't, he doesn't treat him with any kind of honor or respect. He sends a messenger, and he, the messenger says, uh, just go wash in Jordan. The man of God says, just go wash in the river, and you'll be fine. Uh, sort of like if you went to the doctor, and, he didn't even, and you couldn't even get in. Have you ever had that experience? And, and then the doctor said, um, uh, drink, plenty, drink plenty of fluids, take two aspirins, and call me in the morning. That's what he felt like. And so Naaman, is in time, he, he goes into a rage. I thought he'd come out and he'd call on the name of his God. I thought he'd do something. I'm not doing this. But his servants persuade him to do what the man of God said. So he goes to the Jordan. He dips himself in the, in the Jordan River three times. And we come to the punchline of the whole account. This is what it's leading up to. This is what it's telling us. This is what it meant to tell the people who read this centuries ago and what it means to say to us. Now I know that there is no God in all the world except this God in Israel. How did he know that? Because he washed himself in the Jordan just like the man of God had said and when he got out of the water his, his leprosy was gone. It says that in the text that his flesh was like that of a young boy. If, if you're approaching my age or beyond it you notice that your skin is a little bit saggier than it used to be and you got some of those weird spots maybe and around your neck you got this thing happening and you look at somebody who's 16, 20, 25 and their skin is taut and fresh and, and you can go to the store and buy some kind of goo and smear it on yourself and they tell you it will make your skin like that and it doesn't, does it? Doesn't. So, so the point of that is to say he's not just clean. He is super clean. He's, he's gone beyond clean. The Jordan River has nothing to do with this. It's not a magic place. It has entirely to do about demonstrating to Naaman this idea. You see, if, if he had washed at Far Park, he, wouldn't, he would never have connected it with the God of Israel. He didn't know the God of Israel when this story started. He didn't know him at all. And, and Paul says in Romans, how can they call upon the one of whom they have never heard? Right? And so the whole point of this thing is to get Naaman to do what doesn't make sense so that he can come to this conclusion. 
so that he will see that the only reason that he is whole is that the man of God said that, and that means that the God of the man did it. There, there's no God in all the world except the God of Israel. And, and you see, that's the lesson that we want to learn. Because we are not dissimilar to the king of Israel. Remember, he's the guy who freaks out because Naaman comes with a letter that says, heal him. And he says, that's impossible. I can't do that. Now, we rarely have anybody with leprosy coming and asking us to heal them. The point is, when we're in a crisis, we feel like this is impossible. Don't you? Don't you feel at times at the end of your strength? Don't you feel at times like you've, you've cried out to the Lord and the ceiling is as brass? Don't you feel like sometimes that you've heard about the trustworthiness of God a lot, but you're not sure that you've ever seen it? See, we have to learn that message too. Now, we're going to learn it a very different way a very different way than Naaman, because you, we've been hearing about uh, the God of Israel who comes to us in the man Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ brings all of us, not just Israel, but the whole world. All who will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. All who come through Jesus Christ, who is the way, the truth, and the life. We are connected to the God of the universe through Jesus Christ. But we still struggle with this idea. We still struggle. And... I don't, I'm not condemning you. I do the same thing. I, I, I'll confess to you, this, this week, the end of the week, uh, for some reason, because this week was not extraordinary, but for some reason, at the end of the week, I just was low. Just. And I think it's just the ongoingness of it. Melanie's grandfather used to say, the thing about life is that it's every day. The thing about struggles, the thing about troubles is that they're every day. And so here's the punchline. Now I know there is a God, there is no God in all the world except Israel. There is a God in all the world and he cares about me. And like I said, the time of crisis is a time to think about. How do I tap into this? How do I tap into that passage back in Hebrews that said, um, let's, let's come to the throne of grace so that we can find mercy and grace to help in times of need. See, uh, the, the guy who wrote Hebrews said it, it has to be something you do. You've got to come to the throne of, of mercy. You've got to call out. You've got to seek for that mercy. It, it's, it's, it, it doesn't just fall into your lap. Now, you're not going to have to go down to the, the Pips, Pittsburgh and dip seven times in the mon. And that, you don't, you know, don't expect God to say some weird, goofy thing uh, to you to prove himself to you. He's already done that in Naaman. He's not, he doesn't need to do that. Because you know. The thing that we need to do is to bring our lives into compliance to the things that God's already called us to do. Not to look for weird things, but to, to look for, for hard things like love your neighbor as yourself. Like uh, do, don't return uh, evil for evil, but, but overcome evil with good. Not just return it, but overcome it with good. Like feed the hungry. Like, love mercy, seek justice, walk humbly with your God. See, we know that stuff. That's our Jordan. That's where we need to dip time and time and time again. Here, here are some passages that, teach, uh, that say to us uh, that God desires. He not only has the power, he desires to meet us in our crisis. Uh, so first, uh, first Peter, 
5, 7. You've heard this. Cast your anxiety on him, for he cares for you. Do you know that passage? Write that in the fly of your Bible. So that when there's some anxiety, you can, you can where is that? I can't remember. Look in the front of your Bible. There it is. Oh, yeah, 1 Peter. Philippians 4, 6, you know this passage. Do not be anxious about anything. Well, okay, Paul, how am I supposed to do that? Well, he says, in every situation, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present what you need to the living God. Is he saying that if you pray once, your emotions will become placid and it will be like no problem existed in the world? No. It doesn't mean that. But it does mean that you'll come into the presence of God who is at work in your life and he will continue to give you strength. Hebrews, let us approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find help Uh, find grace to help us in our time of need. Hear those words. That's his desire. If you don't have that marked in your Bible and written in the front or the back, wherever you write the good stuff, do that and then make yourself a little card when you get home and write that out and put it on the mirror in the bathroom so every time you brush your teeth, You do brush your teeth a couple times a day, right? Okay. Um, Every time you brush your teeth, there it is. And it's telling you that the God of mercy wants you to find grace in him that will help you in your time of need. That's what Naaman discovered. That's what Naaman shows to us. Now, this is not an easy thing to do. And so I'm just, I'm going to give you some ideas Uh, These are not mine. I actually uh, got these from um, guideposts online. Uh, I think they're great ideas, so I'm going to pass them on to you. Um, We need to um, we need to reteach our brain. Um, And and that happens um, as we begin to put the Word of God in in our brain. So again, Joshua 1, 5 says, No one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I with, was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. The author of Hebrews takes that text, specifically spoken to Joshua, and writes it in his letter to us so that we know that that principle applies to us as well. I'm confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies, and yet none, one of them is forgotten by God? Indeed, the very hairs on your head are all numbered. Don't be afraid. You are worth, it, worth more than many sparrows. See, we need to hear those messages from our God over and over and over. That's in the Bible over and over and over because we need to know it over and over and over so that we can call upon him on the basis of these over and over. So, first thing is pray. You got to got to start here, pray. Again, we're back at the Philippians passage. Uh, don't be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. Start with that. You, here's my need, Lord. Uh, I don't know the solution. Uh, here's what I'd like. Here's how I'm feeling about it. Help me. Then we've got to retrain our minds. Um, we gotta, we got to learn uh, that the God we cannot see is present even though he is invisible. And the only way we learn that is to keep beating it into our head. It's like teaching your grandchildren to take their plate out to the sink at the end of a meal. You do that by saying to them after every meal, 
please take your plate out to the sink. And then they get up and they take it and they put it in the sink, right? If you never say, if you only say that once, they will only ever do it once. <laughs> if we only ever hear this once, we will never do it at all. I'm confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Are you confident of that? Teach your mind. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart. And wait. Wait. He's, he isn't given up on you. Hold, hold on. Hang in there. Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? Not, not one of them is forgotten by God. Indeed, the very hairs on your head are all numbered. So don't be afraid. If you, you're worth a lot more than sparrows. You're more than a whole pile of them. You are worth to God the blood of his Son. Does your heart know that passage? Does your soul know that? Or is that just something that rattles around in your head and you think about it when the preacher says it? See, we want to hang on to those so that when we feel like the sparrow that has been forgotten, although he does not exist, we can call on that verse and say, not only has he not forgotten me, but he's counting the hair on my head. He knows every detail about me. I don't need to be afraid. I am afraid. But my fear is not real. He is the real thing. Then the next thing you got to do is relax physically. You know, if you're tied in knots, uh, it helps to untie some of those. Um, the, the mind can't always overcome what the body is doing. Sometimes you got to let the body help the mind out a little bit. And so relax. Take some deep breaths. Do you do this? I'm going to do that with me. Now, you're only allowed to exhale a little bit. But you can inhale all you want. All right? So take a deep breath. Now hold that until we're done here. No, you can exhale. Get some fresh air. Go outside. Or go in where the air conditioning is on. Stretch. Walk around. Do something. You'll find that as you do those things, your body will tend to relax. And that'll help your heart and your mind take the texts that you are trying to learn. And then the last thing is give it to the Lord. And I like this, this guideposts, and they, they give us this system. First thing, write the problem down. Tell the Lord about it, but write it down. Something about writing it down that makes... That makes it powerful. And then do something to release the physical tension. What we just talked about, deep breaths, fresh air, walk around, do a couple stretching things. Read the scriptures that we just talked about. You'll want to find those. And then trust the, and that, trust the Lord. That is, say it. Lord, I don't understand. I'm struggling. I trust you. I'm going to give this to you, and I know you are on my side. So I'm giving it to you. Consciously give it to the Lord. And then take that piece of paper that you wrote it down on, tear it up, and throw it in the trash. And that la let that be giving it to the Lord. You might have to do that a couple times. That's okay. That's okay. This is about learning, seeking, teaching ourselves what Naaman learned in the Jordan. There's an Anglican theologian a couple centuries ago named Frederick Nolan. Uh, at one point he was fleeing from his enemies in a time of persecution and uh, he was pursued for miles, and finally, uh, he took refuge in a small cave. Um, but after he went in there, his fear started to grow, because uh, if his enemies looked in the cave where he was, if they knew where it was, uh, they would find him, and there was no way of escape. And then he noticed that a spider began to build a web 
at the opening of this cave. And it kept working away and working away, and pretty soon it had, it had uh, weaved a, a, a web across the whole opening of the cave. A visible, heavy spider web. Shortly after that, his pursuers reached the place, and they looked at the cave. They didn't know about it. But they saw the unbroken spider's web and believed that no one could have gone in the cave without breaking the spider's web. So they didn't look further, and they went on. Nolan later wrote, Where God is, a spider's web is like a wall. Where God is not, a wall is but a spider's web. We want to be where God is and know that he is with us. Pray with me, please. Heavenly Father, we are, by our fallen nature, uh, weakened. Our faith is something that we have to pick up a time and time again. And, and we do come upon trials and trouble throughout our life. And often we feel the stress, the pressure, the grief through them. And we come out the other side only because of the passage of time. So we want to learn that in that passage of time, you are with us, regardless of what our senses tell us. So Lord, I pray that you would plant these thoughts, this image of Naaman in our minds, in our deepest being. And then, Lord, teach us to do some of these things so that, that those words become our life. And we will be able to find refuge behind even a spider's web when you are there. We, your people, ask for this grace before the throne of mercy because this is our time of need. Amen. Stand and listen to Standing on the Promises, and then we're going to read the text. Standing on the promises of Christ my King, through eternal ages let his praises ring. Glory in the highest I will shout and sing, standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God my Savior. Standing, standing. I'm standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises that cannot fail. When the howling storms of doubt and fear assail, by the living word of God I shall prevail. Standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God my Savior. Standing. Standing, I'm standing on the promises of God.
John writes, See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called the children of God. And that is what we are. So go in the love of the Lord, and for those to whom love is a stranger, be the image of the Father's love. Amen.